Hello, I'm Sean Duffy, founder of the Duffy Agency and lecturer here at the Lund University School of Economics and Management. Today, I'd like to tackle one of the most challenging problems in brand management, and that is defining exactly what a brand is. Now, why is that so hard? Well, despite the fact that over the last 20 years, every marketing expert on earth has basically chimed in on the subject, it is still considered the most confusing term in marketing and business in general. And if you want to see just how misunderstood, well, just take a look at Google. Here is a collection of definitions that I've gotten off of Quora. If you look at what is a brand on Quora, you'll find these first 15 come up first. And there's also a, a definition from Campaign Magazine, which I thought was pretty appropriate. But as you can see, they're all over the place. A brand can be an expectation, a gut feeling, a promise delivered, a core definition of a company, a brand, a belief, your image. It seems like it could be pretty much anything. And while all these different concepts uh, make for interesting dialogue on Quora or, or elsewhere, they have real world implications for brand management. And while they're built around some grain of truth, I'd argue that pretty much all of them are wrong. If you think of it this way, if I were to ask you, what is a beer? You could say, well, a beer is a, a party in a bottle, or a beer is social lubricant, or a beer is good times, or a symbol of reward. All of those things are true and very poetic, but they're not very useful if you want to make beer. A second factor is if you take most of those definitions and look into them a little more deeply, you'll find that most of them fall apart pretty quickly under logical analysis. Either they're circular definitions, they're overly broad or narrow, they're obscure, or they contradict themselves. So today, I'm hoping we can clear up some of this confusion by going through these points. And the points I'd like to talk about is first, frame the problem. Where is it and how did it start? Second, ask ourselves what is a brand and come up with a working definition. Part of that definition will be to separate out something called brand derivatives. After that, if we know what a brand is, we should ask ourselves, what exactly is the activity of branding, something that we do every day? And lastly, what is brand equity? It's the reason we do all this, and we hear a lot of about it, but it'd be nice to have a working definition. To start with framing the problem, I first asked myself, how could it be that so many super bright marketers have defined this word, yet none of their definitions agree? And the more I thought of it, I found an answer in a parable. It's called the parable of the six blind men. The idea is basically that six blind men encountered an elephant for the first time. They're asked to study the animal and define it. So the first blind man grabs the trunk and proclaims that an elephant is a type of snake. The second grabs a tusk and proclaims that an elephant is a type of spear. One grabs the ear and proclaims that elephants are just like fans. The other one grabs a leg and says it's a tree. The other one grabs a stomach and says it's a wall. The last one grabs a tail and says an elephant is basically a sort of rope. Now, the parable demonstrates how although a person's subjective experience can be true, they can at the same time be completely wrong about the wider implications they draw from those. When we apply this to defining a brand, we have a different animal, but pretty much the same outcome. Our gurus are all over the place in defining this beast. Like wise blind men feeling an elephant for the first time, each brand consultant has their own take depending on their perspective. It doesn't mean their perspectives or their perceptions are wrong, but the conclusions that they're drawing about the parts do not really help us define the whole. And it does little to guide marketing on an operational day-to-day -day level. In fact, it would seem as if each expert feels compelled to raise the issue to a new level of complexity. And as we've seen, they're doing a pretty good job. The result of this confusion is that we can't really talk about brands in a coherent way with our colleagues, with our bosses, with our shareholders. And that doesn't help us manage them very well. In fact, I would say that it impedes our ability to have any kind of organized brand management, except for your own personal form of brand management. If that were the case, what could we expect the outcome would be inside the organization? Well, if it were that way, you'd expect there'd be a lot of confusion 
that brand strategies would be confused with more tangible, tangible branding tactics like naming, logo development, and graphic identity programs. We'd expect a degree of vulnerability where marketers would be prone to abuse when we buy and develop services because we don't actually know what we're buying in the first place. We'd expect to be underfunded in our branding efforts because we really wouldn't be that convincing when we're asking our CEO or boards to take us seriously and fund our efforts adequately. Deprioritization. We'd have difficulties getting our brand development programs prioritized relative to more understood programs, like sales development. We could probably expect pushback, difficult in getting people to cooperate with our brand development programs once we did get them running. And paper tigers, brand strategies that exist only on paper but are never really operationalized because the concept was never really understood in real world terms from the start. Faulty metrics, people applying the wrong metrics to measure the success of our brand development programs, like applying sales metrics to branding programs. And failure, successful brand development initiatives being labeled as failures because they didn't live up to those metrics that were faulty in the first place. And of course, stigma, business leaders concluding that branding is basically a waste of money and cultivating an anti-branding climate inside the company. And of course, there's what we've just seen, the pointless speculation, the definition of branding treated as if it's a personal choice among marketers. And this is pretty much what we do see when we look at the organizations today. So who's really to blame for all this mess? Well, I'd say it's probably us, you and I. We are the marketing industry. We are the vanguards of the brand, yet, We've failed in the simple task of actually defining what a brand is and what the activity of branding is. I don't know if we can actually solve all of that today, but I'd like to take a, a try. If we consider our colleagues in professions like law, medicine, or accounting, can you imagine a, a CFO of a company calling up his different department heads in different countries and saying, I'd like a profit and loss statement, or I'd like a, a balance sheet. He pretty much knows what he's going to get back. But if you take the CMO and have him call up the same, his marketing colleagues in different countries and ask for a positioning statement or a brand architecture, really you have no idea what's going to come back. And that's where not having an accurate definition of this can actually start to erode your branding programs. If we can recognize the absurdity of that situation, it's my hope that perhaps we, at least us, can start to change that. So where do we start? I'd like to ask that for the next 20 minutes or so, we just forget whatever definition of the brand we are operating under and try to approach this with an open mind. Because if we can do that, there's a pretty good chance we might be able to see the whole elephant. And in the process, I'm hoping that today you'll gain a new understanding of your brands how they work, and how you can better manage them. So here's where we'll start. A really simple question, what is a brand? Let me paraphrase Al Rice. He said, a brand in the marketplace is very similar to a brand on the ranch. It differentiates your product from all the other cattle on the range, even if all the other cattle on the range look pretty much alike. This is a definition that I found useful. A brand is basically a trademark used to differentiate one product or company from others in the same category. And of course, a trademark is a name typically presented with a specific design treatment, symbol, phrase, or combination of those. A distinguishing mark, a symbol, like this one. A brand really is no more, no less. It's pretty straightforward, so you have to ask, where's all this confusion coming from? I think this phrase helps sum up some of it. This was coined by Chris Kenton in an article in Business Week several years ago. The name of the article was, What Exactly is a Brand? I've included a link at the end of the slideshow so you can look it up yourself. But his basic premise is your brand is your name, your logo, your trade dress. You own it. There are clearly written laws to protect it. It's, as ta it's tangible enough to put a price on, and yet, an entire generation of marketers has found a way to obscure the obvious, to make the brand more fantastic, to make it hard enough to understand that you need consultants to help you figure it out. He defined the brand very much as we have. He called it a burning scar. 
And the article was said to have triggered the greatest response for a marketing article in the magazine's history. Now, Kenton maintains that all the stuff associated with brands has basically, lumped, has basically been lumped under one word. Things like brand archetype, brand architecture, brand experience, brand guidelines, brand persona, brand promise, etc. He says these are brand derivatives. They are not the brand. And they warrant their own definitions. I've listed out just 54 of them here, but I bet there's more. Um, and many of these are used interchangeably, as if they're the same thing, and they're not. Kenton summarizes with this concise explanation of a brand. Your customers own their impressions, and you can influence those impressions with the quality of your product and the experiences you foster. But your brand is just the symbol that anchors those impressions to the product you create. Now, if we can live with that definition, then I'd like to explore a little bit the activity of branding. If logic ruled, there would be a certain definition of a brand. Well, it would really be this simple. If a brand is just a symbol, then here we have a symbol, and here we have a dollar and nine cents worth of bananas. Literally, then, branding would simply be the act of putting the symbol onto the product. And that's really all there is to it. Except you may have noticed something changed, the value of the banana. And it's why you should not be focusing on branding as such. Bill Birnbach uh, had a very classic quote. If you're not a brand, you're a commodity. And then you can only compete on price. That is the ROI, return on investment, of branding. You invest in a brand to make sure you never have to compete on price. The difference in price is in direct proportion to the difference in perception, value perception, from the consumer. And it takes skill to maintain that kind of public perception. So what we really should be focusing on is this, adding meaning and relevance and differentiation to that symbol. And that's the hard part. It's something that requires super careful management. Unfortunately. When marketers talk about branding, they're rarely talking about applying the logo to the product. They're usually talking about other things, derivatives, and managing those derivatives, with the aim, of course, of increasing brand equity. So in usage, branding actually means, by most of the people you'll be working with, crafting and or managing all this stuff these are all important aspects of brand management, for sure. And if we use the correct words for them, I think we could manage them even better. Some people like to define the brand by its derivatives to emphasize that brands communicate through all the touch points, not just promotion. And I get that. But it's still no excuse to label 55 distinct marketing concepts with the same word. This is 54, and I'm including the idea of applying the logo with 55. Here's another way to look at it. Forget about branding via promotion. Start to think about perception management via touch points. I think this is what they're trying to get at. So if managing a brand means managing those derivatives across all the touch points, how can we distinguish branding from marketing or sales? Every company has its own way of answering that question. But Here's an operational definition of what these different words could mean in day-to-day -day usage and activities. We see marketing as an activity to increase market demand through the strategic manipulation of product, price, place, and promotion, resulting in either an increase in sales and or brand equity, which we'll define later. Sales activity, the primary objective of those is to generate short-term liquid equity measured by revenue received in return for delivery of a product or service over a given time period. And then there are brand activities. The primary objective here is the generation of long-term non-liquid e equity in terms of the ability of the brand to increase the likelihood of future sales measured by the degree to which activities around the brand have been able to develop consumer awareness, understanding, interest, trust, trial, belief, affinity, loyalty, and adequacy. And we'll talk a little bit more about those later. Here's a model 
that kind of puts all that together into, into one picture. Sales and branding basically are working off the same tool set, but with different objectives. And that causes friction. For instance, sales will often want to lower price to move product, generating a purchase. However, brand says that that might hurt the value perception and long-term profitability and the possibility of future sales. And one problem that also comes up is when branding activities are measured by metrics designed to measure sales activities, if there's confusion in the company about the difference between the two. And this happens a lot. This is another way to look at it, if you might. I like this diagram because it really shows how the relationship between sales and branding should exist. A healthy business needs both, and arguing about which one is more important is pretty foolish. It's like arguing if your heart is more important than your lungs. Obviously, you need both. And a lot of executives tend to dismiss branding talk because they feel it's a soft issue. They favor more reason and fact-based, fact uh, which sales often delivers. But the problem is that if you don't get past the perception barrier, you don't get to the fact-based information. If what I think, I feel, and I believe are negative, towards your brand, I'll never get to what I know, because that requires a lot more time and effort on the consumer's part. So if you talk to pundits, or just read some articles, you'll see that they're trying to convince you that everything a brand does is basically branding. And while I would argue that yes, the aim of branding is to shape people's perceptions, and B, everything a company does, does shape perceptions, I wouldn't say that everything a company does is branding. Um, if that's the case, then branding is everything. And in the same time, it becomes nothing, because we can't manage everything. Uh, I think the one factor that should be included in any definition of branding is intent. Adding intent narrows the definition down to something we can actually work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what tethers branding back to reality. Without that tether, it's just a hollow, esoteric theory. If the word branding is to have any operational meaning, then it has to involve intent. And that is the strate strategic manipulation of product, price, place, or promotion specifically intended to increase brand equity in a measurable way among a specified target group across specified touch points over a specified period of time. All the other things that can happen to shape public perception about your brand are just dumb luck. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just they're not what we would call, in this definition, branding. OK, so the last point. If we understand what a brand is and what brand equity is, then, and what branding is, what is brand equity? I'm sure you've heard that term a lot, as, as have I. And like brand or branding, there's many definitions of what brand equity is. The idea is if we can't come to a conclusion on what it is, we're probably not going to be able to manage it very well. To define it, I'd like to start back with the sales funnel. And if you've seen Glen Gary, Glen Ross, you might remember this scene, uh, this sales function of attention, interest, decision, and action. Great advice for hardcore sales, not really good when you're marketing online. The classic sales funnel is a finite process. It takes the consumer in at the top and spits them out at the bottom. The traditional sales funnel ends in an action, and that's a sale. And that generates figures that are easy for everyone to understand. But what if we had a plan to get that person to buy again, and perhaps again? And what if we could also get them to get other people to buy as well? That's the difference between a sales strategy and a brand strategy. And I'd like to look at that now. The job we need to get done in the market is to overcome certain hurdles that lie between us and having people advocate for our brand. We've modeled this. About a decade ago, we moved from AIDA to create a more nuanced view of the path that today's consumer takes. And it doesn't end in a sale. In fact, it's not a funnel. It's a cycle. It takes you in on one end and doesn't spit you out on the other. It keeps you in circulation. If we could go through this, I'll use the example of, let's say, uh, a crayon. 
So inertia is the point where you don't know about the product or perhaps the brand at that point. And then something happens, some spark, and you're made aware of the brand. That doesn't mean you know what they're selling or what it is, you're just made aware of it. Uh, after that comes understanding. Aha, uh -huh, I understand, it's a crayon. But why would I be interested in crayons? The next stop is interest. And this has to do with why should you care about that crayon? Aha, uh -huh, it's a crayon that washes off the walls. Well, that's really interesting to me because I have a two-year-old at home who's always drawing on the walls. That's really something interesting. The next is trust. Aha, uh -huh, it's Crayola. I remember that brand. I used to use those crayons when I was a child. They must be OK. Trial. Well, they're at Walmart, and they're pretty much the same price as the other crayons. I'll give them a try. Belief. Wow. They do just what they said they would. He wrote on the walls, and I was able to wash it right off. Affinity. Aha, uh -huh, Crayola brand. They're into educating children and art. I'm into those things, too. I really like this brand. Loyalty. They're at Walmart. They're always available. The price is right. I'll keep on buying. And then advocacy. And this is something that we can actually help promote in our community. Crayola puts a, a contest online saying, put up your photos from your, or put up drawings that your son or daughter has made, and get your friends to vote for them. And if they win, you'll get a free trip to the Museum of Art. Um, hopefully, once they're up to that level of advocacy and that they're talking about you online, you want to keep them in that loop. Have them keep buying and telling, and buying and telling, and giving them reasons to buy and tell with fantastic service, fantastic product, contest, online competition. So if we take a look one step back, the derivatives we talked about are actually related to this model. And I've tried to fill some of them in here. If we look at awareness, well, that's really going to be related to mentions or SEO or promotion. I see you. That's going to be probably related back to your media strategy. Understanding, are you in the right category? Uh, is your name and profile clear enough that people can understand what your product is? Interest, what's your value proposition? Is it clear? How are you positioned within your category? Trust, what's your brand story, your brand narrative? Uh, do you have recommendations? Are you familiar to them because you've shown up enough in their lives? Trial, price and place, belief. What are your key claims and support? Affinity, brand values and what causes you stand for. Loyalty, quality control, value reinforcement, advocacy, associations, platforms, and the social currency you offer. All these things, these strategic points, come back to driving consumers through this cycle. We've taken a journey, first to define what a brand is and a working definition. We've talked about branding, what the activity of working with that brand and managing it is. And we've talked about the objective of branding, which is brand equity. And we have a model for that. In class, I'd like us to continue this discussion and take it to the next level and talk about what is a brand strategy then? I have added uh, some links. We have six links at the end of this, which are further reading in case you'd like to look a little bit more deeply into the subject. I'd highly recommend reading what exactly is a brand by Chris Kenton. I think you'll enjoy that. So thank you, and I look forward to continuing this discussion in class. Mm -hmm.